Yes, we just pray for the word that Chris has prepared and uh, just bless him. May your Holy Spirit flow through him and may our hearts be open to receive what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brian, can I move this forward a bit? Cool. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it amazing that when you prepare a word and the whole service is preparation into it, the Holy Spirit is wonderful. So, what do you think of when I say the cross? Anybody? Victory. Exchange. Jesus. Salvation. Trial. Purchase. There's so many things at the cross. But do we see it as what it is? Or do we just see it as a nice symbol? that represents things. It has become the symbol of the only event that has the potential to save the whole world. But it's more than a symbol. It's a reminder of a real life event. That of the painful death of the only savior of the world. The only son of God. Jesus. We've talked about our faith, our truth. That is where our faith and truth are. And when we gave our life to Christ, that's where it started. That is where it started. So if you have doubts now, we need to go back to where it started. The cross of Christ. Do we give enough importance to it? Is it just a Sunday thing? Just an Easter thing? It's our life. Galatians 6, 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Here we see in Paul's conclusion to the Galatians, that he is really drumming home a point that he has been making all the way through the letter. Paul is trying to get across that God, that it is God and not man that saves. And what Jesus did was so important for us all. In fact, that it is so important that he takes to writing the end of the letter in his own hand. He would normally dictate his letters. And not just in his own hand, in large letters, just to emphasize the point he's trying to make. You can just imagine him, he's going, you need to get this. You need to get this. I get a sense of his frustration in this. Paul has told them about the saving grace of God before. And in this letter, he is reminding them of, them, of this. In chapter one, he writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. He is saying, 
that this is so important. You need to get it. There is no other gospel. There is no other good news. Being a Christ follower isn't about trying to maintain salvation by obeying some moral standard. It's about being saved through grace. By the finished work of Christ on the cross. This is a relationship with Christ that you enter. It's not a religion. It's not about I must do this, I must do that to get saved. It's about I want to do this. I want to do that because I am saved. It's liberating. It's freedom. We aren't striving for the impossible impossible because Jesus made it possible. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. But we've just read in 6.14, it says, May I never boast except in the Christ of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The cross of Christ is so important. And you should know that. And you do know that. But sometimes we just need a reminder of what the truth is. We need a reminder of what he's done for us. Without God, we have nothing. We're owed nothing. But in him... Our weakness is made strength because our reliance is on him and him only. The cross of Jesus Christ matters so much and we can boast in that. We must never forget what he has done for us. Not we have done what he has done. Who thinks they're deserving of this? We are an an undeserving people that have been rescued by a loving father. That is who we are. Child of God, loved by a loving father. Paul got this so much. He is saying throughout his writings... I pledge I will never boast in anything in myself except this, the cross cross of Christ. I will talk in a way to glorify him and exalt him. You know what I did. I am the one whose life led to the crucifixion of Jesus. My thoughts, actions, and motives led to the death of Jesus. I could boast in that, or I could boast in the fact that Jesus took the punishment away from me. I will boast in Jesus. There is nothing to boast in me. I am undeserving and sinful, but Jesus took away my condemnation. So I will not boast in myself. I am not going to glory in the flesh. And I'm not going to allow other believers to glory in the flesh. I am going to glorify Jesus and the cross. Not the symbol, what he did. What a changed man Paul became. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God died for us. Out of this, we undeservingly gain that is the grace of God right there. When we believe in him, we become new creations in him. Verse 15 in the Galatians passage points out that's what counts, that we are new creations. Jesus' crucifixion was all believers' crucifixion. 
His death was all of our death. Paul was radically changed, and that shouldn't be a surprise. This is the saving power of Jesus and the cross. And it's the same for all of us. Our lives shouldn't be normal. They should be radical. But radical should be normal. Because the old has gone and the new has come. That should be our lives, church. The new creation means that we have come into a union with Jesus. Our thinking is transformed more into his thinking, as Nigel has just said. And we see the world different to how we see it before. We see the pleasures and powers and possessions of the world differently. It doesn't mean our past is eradicated. But our wrongdoings are forgiven. And we become more aligned to Jesus and his way of thinking. That is someone who wants the very best for you. Someone that can use your past for better. That is exactly what happened to Paul, and that's exactly what Jesus wants to do with your lives. I don't want anyone here to say what they've done in the past stops you having a close relationship with Jesus. I don't want anybody here to say, my past will stop me doing God's work. Paul is a, a prime example of this. He demonstrates that you can be so against God, but when you come into relationship with him, he can use you for amazing things. Each of you here, he can use you for amazing things. Amen? Amen. Jesus wants you to draw near to him. We are all undeserving and have all fallen short of his glory. But he loves you. And he wants the best for you. Just as any loving father would. Don't let your past hold you back, church. Step into what God wants for you. Step into God, what God wants you to be doing for him. This isn't so we can big ourselves up and boast in ourselves. It's so we can boast about what Christ has done for us and give him the glory. Being a follower of Christ should not be boring. And if it is for you, don't settle for it. It's about chasing Jesus and his heart. We declared last week, I will come and follow you, Jesus. I believe that Jesus is moving. So to follow him, we have to be moving as well. Otherwise, he's getting further and further away. And we want to be closer and closer to him. Amen. As a teenager, I was very much against there being any kind of God. I would deny him. I couldn't see how he existed with what was going on in the world. But he's a loving God. And by grace, he has shown me a way. Show me a way to him. And without him, I don't think I would have done a lot of things that I've done in my life. I'd be living a totally different life. Living probably for me, not for him. It's exciting following Jesus. Amen. It's exciting. Let's be excited. Yes, it can be daunting. But there's fun in that as well. And it's all worth it. And all because of what he did for me. So I give him glory for these amazing experiences. And I know that I am forgiven for what I believed before. 
We also see in this Galatians 6 passage, warning signs. How we shouldn't be prideful like the false teachers. It's easy to say when things are going bad, I don't deserve this. Who are we to know what we do and don't deserve? We're not God. Chris has already spoken about trials this morning. Who knows what we deserve except God? But he still loves us. He is the just one. When things are going well, how easy is it to say, that's down to me? Like the teachers here, they were trying to get the praise. They were trying to get the praise of they were saving these people for helping them do their circumcision. We say, I deserve the praise in that. I deserve to boast in that. That's not right, church. And the world out there is full of self-promotion. How many likes? How many followers? How much money do I earn? How can I impress someone and boast in it? That's not God's way. We can even do it as Christians. And most of the time, I honestly don't think it's deliberate. We can just say things badly. Like, I saw this many people saved. I saw these people healed. The focus is on I. What about God saved this many people? God healed these people. It's a simple turn of phrase. But the focus is then on him and not I. And that's where our focus should be. It's not a competition, church. We all have the same spirit. We should make sure God gets the glory and we should all work as one. Pride is not good. These false teachers were wanting to take the glory. It was about them and not God. Don't fall into this trap. Jesus Christ and his death were a big problem. Because Jesus was saying there is another way. And in fact, it's the only way. It's his way through the cross. It wasn't an obvious way for king, the king to save the world. But it was the way that had been spoken about for years and years and years. The only way that we can get to the Father and have a relationship with him is through Jesus and through his cross. It's not stopping at the cross. It's going through the cross and going to him. We We give our lives up and submit to him because he made the ultimate sacrifice for you and me, for all of us. He paid the highest price for a moment on the cross. He was rejected by the Father so that all of us could be accepted by him if we come to him and say, Jesus, I want you, I need you. God came down to earth as a baby. His name is Jesus. He lived the only perfect life. He had no sin, but became the sin for you and me. So that all our sins are forgiven. All of them, past, present, future. He gives us a chance to have eternal life in him. Rather than face a death. Because he loves his children. And if you believe in him, you are a child of God. He knew that there was no way that we could save ourselves. We could not keep the law. 
So he gave us a rescue plan. The cross of Christ. Jesus, a way to the Father. He was whipped, a crown of thorns wrapped around his head, stuck and dug in. He had to carry his own torture implement, the cross. Carrying it on flesh wounds that were deep and bleeding. He was spat at, shamed, abused, then hung up with his hands and nails nailed to the cross. He did that for you and me. He did that for you and me. That is how much he loves you, church. That is how much he loves you. And as he died an agonizing death on that cross, he cried out, it is finished. He had defeated the enemy and therefore death. In that, he became victorious. What he did was perfect because we couldn't be perfect for him. It was for you that he paid the price on the cross. A gift to you, to each one of you. That is why we must give Jesus and the cross more. It grounds us. It reminds us that it's all for him. And all because of him. He deserves all the praise and all the glory. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We are nothing without him. We have no hope without without what he did. That is why we should boast in the cross of Christ. And our focus and attention should firmly be on Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is our God. That is Jesus Christ. That is the King of Kings. That is who we serve, church. So I leave you with some questions. Do you have a relationship with him? And if you don't, do you want to enter one with him? He died for you and me. Who or what are you boasting in? And what is Christ doing in your life that you can boast in him? Church, we should be full of testimony. We should be full of what Jesus is doing in our lives. We need to be excited. We need to raise up and we need to step into what he's got for us. That is why he paid the price for us. Not for us to sit and think, oh, I can do a Sunday morning. I can do Easter. I can think of the cross then. He's worth more, church. We need to glorify him and boast in him more. That should be our walk. And when we do that, the fruit that we will see will be incomparable to what we're seeing. Because it will all be about him and what he's done for you and me. So, could I have a prayer ministry team, please? We're going to pray now. And then, if anything's touched you in this service, I want you to come up and receive prayer, receive a word from him, because he loves you, and he wants you to draw near to him. If you're suffering with pride, if you're suffering with being bored in Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, 
come and get prayer. If you just want to come and say, thank you, Jesus, come and get prayer. There is nothing like drawing close to him. So if you can, church, I want you to stand and we're going to just pray and lift him up and glorify him. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you died for me. I thank you that you gave it all up for me. I thank you that I can glorify you and boast in you because of what you've done and that I'm free to do that, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No other words seem worthy of what you've done for me. But I am so grateful that I can stand here and thank you for the cross. Father, I pray for anybody here that's been touched by your spirit, convicted by your spirit, Lord. I pray that they step into more of you, more of what, they, what you want for them, Lord. Father, at the cross, you forgave us. You forgave us. And if you aren't living in that forgiveness, church, come and get forgiveness from him. Come to him and ask for forgiveness because he's dealt with it. But you need to know it, church. Because with that, you can be liberated, you can be free. Father, I thank you. We lift you high. We lift you higher and higher, Lord. Father, help us boast in you. 